What are you? What am I? I'm as close as you're getting to Beyonce, kid. Um, kid. But what is this place? And is the line for merch shorter? This isn't funny! Hello, spirits. We, uh... We hate Velma, right? Velma, ever since January 2023, has been known as the worst animated show in history. Does it deserve that pedestal? Oh yeah. Oh, believe me, it does. We're unfortunately in a decade where adult animation needs to be entirely comedies with senseless violence, gross-out humour, and has next to nothing likeable about the shows themselves. I wrote this script before, and I recorded this on the trailer release date for Mr. Bertram. I wish what I say were coincidences! Oh, for five minutes, could you not be yourself? FOR FIVE MONEY! Now to run a little history by you, Velma was announced with some skepticism, but overall it was just a cool idea to see the gang solve a serial killer mystery. Only, as more details came out, it was... bad. Just so, so bad. But it's a happy coincidence that the next day after I watch Velma, I get to watch the Knuckles. I was going to watch it and review it, compare it as well. But it's more of a way show, which is... great. So I decided why not Velma and Green Lantern, the animated series. I wanted to do a video on that anyways. Oh my goodness! And it's two shows that were given an older IP and transformed it into something different. Both shows also technically had two seasons, so without further ado, Velma Season 2, old IPs and new directions. In the Scooby-Doo franchise, most of the time the cast members will consist of the most recognisable ones. Fred, Daphne, Velma, Shaggy, and Scooby driving around in the mystery machine. Sometimes, depending on the decade, the team members can switch or have new additions. Hey, remember when Shaggy had a red shirt? To run by the cast of characters behind Velma, they consist of Velma, Fred, Daphne, Norville. And before anyone says it, Norville is the canonical name for Shaggy, which is just a nickname. This was either stated as canon before or after Mr. Incorporated, who name dropped it a few times. Norbert, catch! You drive! Me drive? Norbert? Anyways, the race of the gang had all been switched except for Fred. Now, blah blah blah, switch any race. Make them interesting, I've said this a few times now. And they didn't accomplish that! And so a year later, seeing all the hate for the show. Did they fix it? <sighs> no. No, they did not. Velma in the show is a Rick and Morty fan if the show was canonical. She's a meta-written speak-and-say box who relies on that for a majority of her comedy. Daphne is a confused teen who tries to learn who she is while having... Okay, for the sake of this, every character speaks in a meta way. Daphne tries to learn who she is as the adopted child of two policewomen and the blood relatives of criminals. Fred is a mama's boy who was raised poorly by his crap mother and restrictive father. Norville is a soon-to-be stress eater who manages to fumble with and without thinking of Velma. I'll get to that. You want to test my pee to ensure the weed's working? <laughs> and you may be wondering, I left out a name. Velma has all these characters except for their most unique one, Scooby fucking do. The reason why, and only finding out now, was because of corporate mandates and they couldn't figure out an adult equivalent of Scooby Doo. Why the higher ups for some reason didn't want their mascot in this show astounds me. Even though with better writing, Velma could have been one of the most memed on shows, but in a good way. Think about it, when the same voice actors swear, that in turn creates memes and promotions. There was this... Cut off your nutsack and nail it to my door! There was that... Note to self, after I take over Skylands, come back and destroy this place! I'd like to see you try, Chaos. Uh, who said that? Are you fucking... And most recently, there was Raymond eating off a cowgirl's ass which was memed upon with thousands of artists drawing their own characters, or characters like Raymond doing that exact same frame. Only different being is that Raymond was actually made by its studio, Ubisoft. And people like this new side of Raymond for multiple reasons. Captain Laserhawk, you only get used to the Assassin Creed fog and washed up Raymond. But imagine if Scooby-Doo was allowed to swear. There's not a whole lot of swearing in the show, which is weird because they have nudity, blood and gore, but swearing. That's where they draw the line. 
but not a lot of swearing from drugged up teenagers. Right. Obviously the show itself doesn't swear a lot, that's because of the neat writing, but that's not the point. Scooby-Doo could have worked within the show since this is an adult version of the old IP. It's a new age rating for the franchise. Only they take their saving grace and stick it up there. To go over Green Lantern's cast of characters, it's pretty simple. In Green Lantern, the most common lantern that would be used in the stories is Hal Jordan, Kilowog, Tomar, Sinestro, and many others. But the events follow with Hal Jordan, Kilowog, Razor, and Aya. Hal is a hotshot lantern who, while unpredictable, knows what he's doing in situations that call for it. Kilowog is the more serious general of the group that knows more about anything than the others do but he's also been through a lot. Razor is a Red Lantern who's forced to help the Green Lanterns by amending his actions, and Aya is the ship's nav computer who solely learns to become a Green Lantern by watching how the other Green Lanterns save others. She also turns into a humanoid mobile lantern a couple of episodes later. Now it's time to talk about how they poorly handle relationships. Something both shows do is a love interest in their shows. It's one of the many hooks a show can do, sometimes they don't know what they're doing, and sometimes the chemistry is so good the creator weren't even planning to have them be a thing. In the two shows I have lined up, there's Hal Jordan and Carol Ferris, hey Jack. Razor and Aya, and Kilowog and Galea. As for Velma, there's Norville, and Daphne and Velma. Let's start with the bigger relationships in question with Velma and Daphne. A part of the season is showing off what their kind of relationship is after the events of season 1 that actually ended them up together. During the season 1 finale, Velma said Norval's name, which pisses off Daphne. Surprisingly, they continue this thread by placing them in a coffin, pointing out the uncomfortableness of it, and realising Velma isn't attracted to Norville. Even though he says he still does, thankfully the writers forgot that little detail so they don't have any more simping scenes. Probably. And you know how this show needs to make a lot of unnecessary conflicts out of nowhere? Well, during the end of the episode they figure out their relationship and why Velma was doubting her feelings. It was because she didn't want Daphne to get hurt during her mystery outings, but However, in classic Velma fashion, she says something meta about soulmates and we would be back to square one if thankfully they didn't get back together at the end of episode two. However, it doesn't feel that deserved when after the raffle pick for Creaky Friday, okay then, they don't actually sit down and talk about it until the end of the episode. I mean, they do have a scene like 10 minutes in about Daphne wanting to have an emotional talk, but for some reason that's also filled with unfunny jokes. Really close to winning Creaky Friday. I know you think it's dumb, but I think you're dumb for not believing in different moisturizers for different body parts. Shut up, you're so annoying! And actually speaking of, it's about time I talk about the new addition to the cast, Amber. I won't say who they're associated to with until much later, but Amber acts as a sort of anti-Velma in the show. She believes in the ways of Wiccan, and for those who don't know, just like I didn't know, and still don't know, it's a sort of supernatural religion featuring witches. Everything that Velma believes in, because she doesn't believe in ghosts, <laughs> funny that, but it's used as a way for Daphne to try and grow herself as a character, which... I will actually admit is a good starting point for people to find out who they are, some turn to any religion, whether they better themselves or redeem themselves with past actions. And Daphne tries to help herself by trying something new that did help her earlier on with Creaky Friday. Though I can't tell if it's disrespectful to do a seance and have the chant be a Beyonce song. I'm not joking about that, they make Velma agree to help it by making it about herself. However, it seems to be a running gag at this point because Velma and Daphne hit a rough patch again at the end of the episode, and then get back together, after having got a lick of screen time together, and then reunite in the seventh episode post credit scene. I'm sorry, but this is not how you write a troubled romance, especially when it's just Velma and her dumbass opinions. While in comparison to this, we have Razor and Aya. To give a bit of context behind their relationship, in episode 2, the Lanterns hand over Razor before he was turned over a new leaf. In turn, this got the Lanterns captured and Razor tortured into revealing his memories to us. It shows how he became a Red Lantern, but the most important part was about his love, Alana, before Aya frees him. And in episode 3, Aya constructs her body. But in episode 8, it's a reveal that Aya modelled her body after Alana. And Razor realises this after it's pointed out by the Star Sapphires, who are powered by the act of love and can find it too. 
Now my only grievance with this is that they don't really acknowledge anything since the story further focus on the other things they've set up and nearing the conclusion. And the only time it is shown is that in the finale, how Jordan needs to go back to Earth to get back to Oa as soon as possible, so he uses the Star Sapphire's love to get to Carol, his true love, who in turn helped him remember. It's this whole thing. And so they use the same method on Razor, who teleports to Aya, his true love. However, he brushes it off how he got there to Aya, who doesn't really know why. Keep in mind, this was all in Story 1. In Story 2, it has a much bigger focus because the main villains are the Manhunters. I'll go more into detail later about the whole story, but basically Manhunters are emotionless machines who kill anyone with emotions. This is where... <laughs> this is where Razor gets racist towards machines. As in Story 2, or what is going to be called Season 2, Season 2 shows that Razor went to the Blue Lantern to control his anger since his resentment towards the Red Lanterns. Immediately as the two see each other, they go one another. But as they wake up a Manhunter that's been supercharged, Razor says the Manhunters can't change because they don't have a soul, which offends Aya. Even if he wasn't referring to her in that moment. But this is where Razor and Aya become the biggest parts of the season, as due to the conflicting feelings Razor has, when he does confess his love for her, it's when she dies. And they don't make a joke out of that either. Everything from Aya's scream of agony to the turn that followed afterwards is fucking immaculate. And when she turns up alive on the body of a Manhunter the next episode, Razor is happy, she's alive, but he's in denial. And when she can't process what kind of love he has for her, he tells her off. And just like how the Manhunters decided any emotions can harm others, Aya turns off her emotions and shuts down and proceeds to blow up the main villain, the Anti-Monitor, but instead replaces him in hopes to rewrite the universe into an emotionless galaxy. They don't spend every waking moment talking because Aya won't change her new directors and the only reason they switched her back was because she hurt Razor when he was about to kill her. Only he doesn't because he has too much love for her to stab her in the back. Now that's the general premise of it as there's other factors, more parts of it connected but to take away from it all, Razor's level of thinking is just survived because imagine losing a true love. Finding someone in her image and trying to come to terms you're in love with machine, it would be hard on anyone. But especially harder when Razor's anger is deeply rooted into the Red Lanterns and anyone who harms or harmed his true loves. Aya doesn't want to feel the pain she does when Razor rejects her, even though later on it's discovered that Aya is a living being with the essence of the Green Lantern's being's energy. I do want to mention this is one of the biggest issues I have with that idea. They never really hinted the idea of a living being inside of THE Green Lantern battery until that moment. I think if they had a bigger focus on if Green Lantern energy could be superpowered to lanterns only without the use of Blue Lanterns, it would fit a lot better. But it's never brought up until that reveal and doesn't have an episode on its own or the screen time to match it. Just like what Velma does with a majority of literally everything in the show. It's a big part of Aya's character that sucks they didn't flesh out better and I can't figure out why. And because of the timing, the place, Hal and Razor couldn't sit down with Aya and talk about it because the Red Lanterns were under threat. And Razor couldn't spend time with Aya because she had enough of them trying to shut her down. Velma and Daphne don't speak for three episodes because antics ensue, with Daphne going to a scientist, brain in a jar, taken by cockroaches because she saved one because it was bullied. I don't know. I I just don't know. Aya was emotionless and Razor was guilty and angry. Velma was an idiot, like any other day, and they get back together because Daphne likes Velma more than Amber. On the lower end of relationships, there's the fumbling Norville and his two other girlfriends. Norville in season 1 was very much a simp for Velma. They even name drop that exact word to describe what he does. However, in season 2 he does have feelings for her still, thankfully not in the way it was before, and he's not as much of a pushover. However, in the show he manages to land Gigi and... This girl's brain. In season one, he somehow fumbled Gigi because he was obsessed with Velma still, but in season two, they set up the relationship between him and Lola. As early as episode two, all the way to the final episode, and an immense amount of time to grow the relationship in which they do. It's like the only healthy relationship in the entire show next to Fred's dad and Dia. Only get this. After nine episodes, we're building up their relationship in a different way than the traditional way since it's just a brain 
there's not a lot you can do. In episode 10, it's revealed Norville's grandmother has the bodies for story reasons and was going to put Lola's brain back in for a small test run. However, in all the writer's glory, they decided that Norville had to pick out the wrong girl Lola was. And that ends their relationship. I hate you! I fucking hate you! What the fuck? What? Imagine setting up your character's relationship status for more than five episodes, only to then break them up over a stupid fucking reason. I rewatched season one twice and I had no idea Lola was Asian, much less could I remember when Lola was killed. In comparison to the Green Lantern series where Carol finds out Hal is Green Lantern after the star Sapphires bring her to her true love. But she gets pissed thinking he has nefarious reasons and that's the power of the star Sapphires corrupting her and others like her. She eventually pulls off the ring after coming to terms that he isn't lying and returns to Earth. And during the finale, she helped him remember why he teleported to Earth. It, again, it's a whole thing about true love and all, and he does this because he gets to Oa to stop Atrocitus. Then, after the events of Story 1, Hal goes back to Earth and finds out Carol fired him. Since he had been gone for months, she could wait, but business couldn't. And at the end of Episode 1, Carol breaks up with him because he has a job to do. Because with the Green Lantern title, they can be gone for days, weeks, months, and they don't have the opportunity to date without being far apart. And that's a better breakup because they have a better reason for it. They don't do it just for the sake of it. They acknowledge how long it's been, but... Unlike with Velma, there was going to be more to them, as in episode 22, Carol has to fight Atrocitus because Aya needs an answer based on anger versus love and which triumphs. In which Carol calls upon her true love, How, even as they're broken up, and she keeps the star sapphire's ring. They most likely would have worked things out, but of course, the show was cancelled. Though they definitely do waste Galea, as this is one of the few parts I didn't like that they didn't focus on which was that Galea was now a Star Sapphire and they just leave that story thread untapped even when having another episode centered on love in Season 2. I'd go over it more, but there isn't a lot they explain or bring focus on. I forgot to say the reason I was disappointed with them not focusing on Galea, especially in Season 2. Kilowog has been hinted to have lost his family during his time as a Green Lantern as early as Episode 1 and told that fact during Episode 7. It's actually pretty sad they couldn't even continue this thread because I have a feeling Kilowog would have had a bigger focus in the next story. Razor wants to find Aya while struggling with a red and blue ring and Kilowog finding himself after the loss of his family and the accomplishments with his friends. There was so much potential, only if Warner wasn't in its current state. But release! Coyote vs. Acme! While the show's not pristine, seriously, this show is so perfect to compare against Velma because they write relationships better, they have more likeable and well-rounded characters, they have... This show doesn't know how to write a story or follow through with anything unless it's the final steps of the season. The story in Velma is as follows, because it's the exact same formula from last season, would you believe it or not? The characters in episode 1 find out there's a killer, they spend multiple episodes wasting time trying to develop the characters or push them further away, or at random points there are more deaths. And then in the last episode, they reveal all the facts, including who the killer was, despite none of the clues pointing to that, UNTIL they unmask them. So in the show, there are five deaths which all get their dicks bitten off. A random teacher, a random priest, two random doctors, and the sheriff from last season. And I wish I could explain in detail how they connect together, but it's... So... So lazily done. So these five people are all government agents that were assigned to watch meddling kids and were all killed because of their involvement. And for some reason, they decided to add a priest. And they do nothing with him but make him watch. Because I know for a fact they only added him for the funny Italian accent he had in one scene he's in. LOL, Lord of Light. Oh, fuck me. It wasn't on. The teacher tried recreating Purdue's work. The brain swapping girl, so yeah, he's a bigger part of it. The doctors need to hide the bodies from the public and the sheriff? I don't know, he tried to stop Velma last season. The other characters outside the sheriff have never been seen before. So them being important, 
doesn't actually feel important. Trust me when I say it'll seem like Charlie half asked everything. Also, can I just correct my mistake that Charlie Grandy is the creator? I'm not apologizing to Mindy because fuck her. And I wish there was more, but they spend so much time on unnecessary garbage I had to skim through the episode and write this fucking script. Speaking of unnecessary, have I mentioned that Norville has hallucinations? Yeah, so after killing Victoria, it makes Norville have hallucinations, and Fred to believe his mother was possessed by Dr. Bradu. It's... oh, so fascinating. However, at some point they discover that Victoria... discovers she's actually a ghost. Yeah, they did a few ghostly things, but they never played it off that she is a ghost until this small scene in episode 8. <laughs> I see you ghost. And then in episode 9 where she reveals herself as a ghost. That she can possess people. And that she's proud of him because he stood up to her. Yeah, so she's in hell. They introduce this concept of ghost for one reason I'll get to and I'll mention why it's so fucking flawed. Now obviously a single mystery formula like that would work if the show didn't have 10 episodes in each season. Like in my last video I talked about Mr. Incorporated and the only thing is that some of the episodes will cop out that kind of ending. Some you could figure out who, some were written to be obvious but overall they had 22 minutes in each episode with a different mystery. Velma has that with one main mystery, and yet they somehow managed to fuck that up. And do you want to know who the killer was? Well, it was the thing they spent no time actually setting up outside a few things. They couldn't get Scooby, so they got Scrappy. And they construct him in the most basic possible way, which is just engineering and genetic garbage. Uh... While I thought it was going to have a hell aspect, I was kind of right. And I don't get Charlie Grandy's vision because you create a world with ghosts and teleporting fog, but a natural talking dog is far-fetched. Fuck off. After Scrappy's first murder, everyone leaves him and then Scrappy and Uncle Scooby go to disappear after getting their revenge, blah blah blah. And what's worse is that Uncle Scooby, the one who's initiated the creation of Scrappy, Amongst the other things in the show, I'm too lazy to look back on. Now to put it into perspective, it took seven fucking episodes before they focus on what was obviously going to be the hook, Uncle Scooby. Uncle Scooby is closely connected to the story, and yet despite episode one in his shrouded appearance, he doesn't exactly show up a whole lot. Most of the episodes are about random things or story threads instead of focusing on the other parts that aren't fun, like Velma being rich. Norville loses empathy for not even 10 minutes. A witch hunt. And then they finally reveal the identity of Uncle Scooby. But you'd think it's Scooby-Doo, right? Because why else would he be called Uncle Scooby? Maybe a human version of him? An adult version of him? Of course not, because it was Sophie. Oh, gentlemen, gentlemen! There's a solution here you're not seeing. Who dressed the way she did so she wouldn't be objectified. As well as her knowing about the doctor and Daphne's body despite her huh, looking back and there's no hint of that at all. And want to know what's even funnier? Every fact she says is shown in flashbacks in that very moment. Funny how, how it's, it's almost, almost like, like season, season one's ending. ending. Throughout season one and two she was never hinted to be more than experienced than she was. She was known as the guy Vilma's dad cheated on six weeks into his wife's disappearance and knocked her up. There was nothing more to it because it was never hinted to do more. But guess what? Green Lantern never wasted many episodes. In fact, most contributed to a bigger story or eventually would have led to more if... Well, if it hadn't been cancelled. All of it had a purpose one way or another, whether to set up future plot points or conflicts or in hopes to stop the Manhunters like Orange Rings. In Season 2, they spend four episodes before getting to Razor, which is one of their main characters in the show. They set up what's happening on Earth and the main antagonist in Episode 1, a bigger problem with the plot, the current status of Iron and Kilowog in Episode 2, and the big bad of the season. Episode 3 reveal where it came from and how much damage it can do by entering an alternate dimension. And then episode 4 set up the conflict between Razor and Aya. 
And what's interesting is that Season 2 focuses on Manhunters, which in Season 1 is why Red Lanterns exist in the first place. Because of the attack of the Manhunters built by the Guardians. It became a primary focus as well as evolving characters and tackling more into their character. They continued where they left off instead of Velma's case, which is something unexpected. In Season 1, the only episodes that don't primarily focus on Red Lanterns or finding a way to stop them is Episode 8. But even then, the episode itself was more useful for something in Season 2, as well as showing the effects it has on others, and especially Green Lanterns. Which is that these Christers in prior episode have another property to be more fearful, which nullifies the Green Lantern's ability of, well, will. And in Season 2, the only episodes where it doesn't offer a way to stop Aya was Episode 18 and 21. One of which would have set up the Yellow Lantern Sinestro and the characters crash on a planet because of Aya. However, I do think that episode is still alright because it does show how the characters are still heroes even without their rings. While there's multiple scenes in Velma that are so unnecessarily used just to fill in the runtime while either filling in with character growth or actual parts of their mystery. Now, obviously Green Lantern is not a mystery show, but it still has some mysteries that were solved because of other episodes. Such as who built the Anti-Monitor, where it suddenly came from, why the Red Lanterns angry at the Guardians, and many more. And the longest mystery being was the Manhunters and Red Lanterns, which was a sort of religion because of how Manhunters destroyed Atrocities people. And how the Guardians try to hide this secret until they couldn't any longer, and obviously that got a further focus in Season 2. The stories in both shows are vastly different, but one show wastes time and death is around it, while other shows are actively trying to figure out answers and solutions. It is so clear the writers have never written mysteries before because there's no hints towards anything. It's all revealed off camera in the last two episodes to the respective villains. Green Lantern actively shows the things they learn either through flashbacks or experiencing it themselves. Or I hadn't mentioned this yet, but when I was watching Green Lantern Manhunter Menace, 13 episodes went by so fast even though there were 13 of them. It went so fast that I looked at the time realising I had been drawing and watching this at 1am. While in comparison to Velma, it felt like a school day to watch it and it's barely two thirds of the time I would be there for. That is how dreadful the show is. He was a bad person. <laughs> you are too funny. So this is crazy, but can I get your number? Oh, uh... Sure, it's 555-0111, like in a TV show, so I remember it easily. Oh, that was cute, right? That was scrappy. <laughs> References in basically anything exist either to nod to something's existence, make fun of it, or even use it as a plot. To not really sugarcoat it as much, Velma uses a lot of references, and since I don't really want to rewatch it again, I'll just show the visual ones. But the show namely uses ones from the Hanna Barbera Studios, or later known as Warner Animation. You've most likely seen the characters a part of this studio with Scooby Doo, the Flintstones, Tom and Jerry, the Jetsons, and just about any character in the show Jellystone. And Velma constantly makes references to the art of the original iterations of Scooby Doo, such as the original Velma and Scooby Project in Season 1, as well as Captain Caveman, the Jetsons, probably more. And in Season 2, they had the original Velma and Daphne. Dick Dastardly and Hex Girls. And guess what? They do nothing with them. The original Velma and Daphne are just... there. Dick Dastardly is shown to be an adult version of itself while parroting The Shining. But most importantly, they decide to add one of the Hex Girls, Fawn. Who I'm only now finding out does Wiccan. Look, I only know about the Hex Girls in Mystery Incorporated and they were in like two, three episodes. And if Wiccan sounds familiar, it's because Amber and her are related. This is her mother. And do you want to know what they do with Fawn? Bringing in a hex girl that has a daughter? Well, no, she's just a reference. That, 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 this is Fawn. And what's sad is that they brought up Beyonce instead of setting up Fawn as like a bigger band that moved into a murder town. She's just someone who owns a creepy store. They had so much potential to do more of her character and make it feel as Hannah Barbera they wanted to make it. But no, let's just reference a modern pop star instead of an in-universe one. Also, something I don't think I brought up in the last video on Velma was its location. Now, Crystal Cove as a town is so barren for locations, it's honestly pathetic. 
Doesn't help that its name was just copy and pasted from Mystery Incorporated, but only it lacked any sort of uniqueness to it. The most you'd see is some random place called Spooners, Fred's Mansion, the police station, the, the school. They never had any places where you would know it or recognize some brands by just seeing a mascot. Unlike Mystery Incorporated with the clam cabin by the beach paired with Skipper Shelton, the bloody steak with this girl that was impressed by Scooby and Shaggy's skills, the mayor's office, and etc. The town felt so big while the Crystal Cove and Velma just feels so small and basic. But in the Green Lantern show, they reference some things in the DC universe that make it feel connected. In episode 11, they need to get a code to a watchtower that acts as a wall between the Red Lantern and Green Lantern space. And the character that has it is this guy. If his design looks familiar, it's not because he's Hawkman, but it's because it's the same race. Now, any race could have been used to give the Lanterns the code, but they use Thanagarians because this is a DC universe. They use them as a reference and also a direct conflict of interest in the story. In order to destroy the Watchtower, they need the code. To get to the code, they need to beat a stronger Thanagarian. And it's the same case in Season 2. During Episode 3, the Steam Lantern, he acknowledged he's inspired by that same Lantern. This Lantern was the original Lantern that had a weakness to wood. It might differ in canon, but this is Alan Scott, the Golden Age Lantern. And they directly mention his design, but not his name. Wore a red shirt and a cape. You know it. A Green Lantern with a cape? Nah, it doesn't ring a bell. It's a neat reference because it also has some weight to it, because if he got out of the alternate dimension, so can Hal. Okay, so I also may have been misinterpreting that a little bit, listening back. I can't remember or find if they ever say he ever came from the original dimension. I didn't really consider that this Alan Scott is from an alternate Earth in the Steam Lantern's dimension. Even still, due to that reference of the Golden Age Lantern, it still inspires the Steam Lantern who's a big hell with the overall story of the episode. And then there's the name drop references that piss me off beyond belief because in the show they don't add Scooby-Doo, so who do they add? Well, you already know. Then why is he looking at me like I'm a chicken leg? <sighs> The Scooby Project and Uncle Scooby, and instead of it just being some talking dog that's integrated with the gang, it's just some military project and a soldier in a costume. While in Green Lantern episode 25, they name drop the lantern that's on Earth now, John Stewart, who if you don't know is this Green Lantern that's primarily better known in Justice League and that one movie people don't like. And there's most likely more references in each show, but to take note is that not every reference needs to be relevant. They can name drop a character like this, an old piece of media like that, and that's fine. But when Velma references something, it's something so obscure, like it came from Family Guy. That's the other part I forgot to mention, they mentioned random things I will never comprehend, much less remember, because it's... Old, old references. Because instead of just referencing the characters we know... Now to give Velma some credit this time, I do want to go over a few pinches of some things I like about this season. I really liked how they add Scrappy for the most obvious reason. While I'm not a fan that he can't be reworked to actually be likeable or cred the way he was, he just had to be written better to be a part of the main cast, which I think someone in this day and age can do, right? But that's the only thing about that I liked. But something that needs to be studied is the difference between how main characters are killed. In Velma Season 2, I have neglected to celebrate, <laughs> I mean, mourn something. Velma, Velma died! died! Eric's. Oh god, I'm so sorry! Chocolate makes me break out! <laughs> <laughs> Velma as a ghost, or rather the concept of ghost, are so flawed it's fucking astonishing. Now in this world, it's pretty normal, it's played straight, but instead, this town has teleporting fog and of course, ghosts. But here's the thing that never made sense, which is that if Velma and Victoria get to be ghosts, why are they ghosts? Even if it's like a chance thing, or a one out of five person thing, you're telling me none of them had unfinished business? Can only people's names starting with the letter V be ghosts? This is where shoving a unique and story-driven concept in without any warning near a finale has consequences. Green Lantern Season 2 does the same thing with mentioning Aya never destroying inhabited planets. Unfortunately, another part of her character that wasn't written right. 
But with Velma introducing us the concept of ghosts in episode 9, they in turn also reveal there's a heaven and a hell with hell creatures. But they never actually show who's actually dead or not because considering they never hint it, oh yeah, ghosts can push other souls out of inhabited bodies and kill those inside other bodies if they're inside too long. So where's Scrappy's ghost? <laughs> Oh my god, he literally had unfinished business killing the head guy in charge. I I just... Playing your story, writers. What do you want to include in this season? <laughs> but in Green Lantern, the main character to die was Aya. She was deemed a killer throughout the entire time she was an emotionless machine. But as the episodes poured out, we learned multiple things about her, and she was able to right her wrongs because she subconsciously knew she wasn't evil because she was created from a living being. I like that Amber wasn't as meta as the other characters. I think they had those moments, but overall, they were alright. The only time I really liked them was in episode 8, where they were terrorizing Olive with the idea of ghosts being real just to mess with her. Oh, and she deserved it because she's a part of Velma. It's actually like the only funny parts about the entire show. Don't ask me. Why did you call me a ghost? And why is that dog barking at me? Oh God, am I the ghost? I actually liked the idea of Dia and Fred bonding since it was different parents and stepmoms trying to bond with their stepkids. I also like how Dia was able to get William to change from just locking her down and not understanding a real relationship. These are actual issues families have when they marry in because it just takes time to build up trust and in cases like this, they had a mentally abusive mother and wife. But even then, they spread these moments out in one episode only or so far apart it's hard to remember it all. And that's it. You know what? No, I have more to say about this. I think something that falls so flat with Velma is that they have the right ingredients for a lot of the stories they're telling. But it's all a bad joke. Daphne trying to discover herself as an adopted child can be very compelling and realistic since a lot of kids and teens go through that sort of mindset. And I like how they try to get her to discover herself in many lives, like with religion or even talking to her inner self. But even then, it's filled with bad ways to get to that point or just, you know, bad jokes. Anyway, from this classic white void, there's a couple of ways these memory-inspired journeys can go. Trial, chased by a giant pencil, go to a meaningful place where each thing is a memory. Oh, that one sounds nice. <laughs> I know I'm a good person. I post on my socials whenever there's an election. You're not even my parents. You're just projections of me. See? <laughs> and I maybe deserve some sort of reward for being so good and brave. The way her story is told is unrealistic, but the basis of her growth isn't. It's the same case with Dear and Fred, since it's a very similar thread, but they never put attention on it outside a few scenes in one episode. I would have liked to have seen them grow a bond over the 10 episodes, where it feels more natural to get married and have a stepson, as well as mending the relationship that Victoria had skewered with her time there, and just so much more that could have been used as metaphors with deeper meaning, like Norval's stress eating over killing a murderous mother causing its hallucination, who Oop, it's just the ghost doing that. They fill the runtime with this screen time with weed jokes, pointless bumps on the road while never really getting to the root of why his stress eating worked. Because <laughs> it's, cl it's clearly not guilt, which could have been the main reason why, but she was a ghost, not a hallucination, even though it's clear they tried to pass it off as guilt. But no, we had to have had instead of Fred cutting off his mother out of his life throughout the season, while showing he still loves her in some way. We get a few episodes of him being dumb from believing a lie from his mother that's stupid beyond belief considering this was before ghosts were in the show. It would have been a strong hook on the show since I know a lot of people still love their family or a family member or to a degree even if they're dead, abusive, cut off, etc. There's a lot of serious stuff in here that could have been all naturally built up while having the characters also find actual clues that fit in within the story. Not finally announce and show that Scrappy was in episode 9. <laughs> no, really, that's when he finally shows up. And the only hints you ever get are, he eats shoes. Because dogs eat shoes. Shoes. Yeah, that's your only clue to guess it's a genetically altered dog that bites dicks off with a microphone in his neck who was cast out because he ate shoes. The writer sure wrote an amazing mystery story, right guys? The heels were here, so I knew it. I will 
Velma Season 2, if anything was better in the way you wouldn't expect it is. Season 1, by every means, is a dumpster fire because it just shits on what it's based on. Does hallucinations as jokes or showing viewers ways that do not work like kissing your crush during a panic attack. And not even building up their antagonist correctly. Season 2 continues to make fun of that the ghost exists. Hypes up another hallucinogenic character, only for it to never be hinted once she's a ghost. And they don't set up their antagonist correctly. But this season was better because it was a lot more boring. They did so little that everything around the important parts was actually so boring to watch. Like, come on, just... FOCUS ON YOUR STORY! Now there is a chance that Season 3 is in production. Now before anyone starts blaming Twitter for hate watching, or me for reviewing it, <clears throat> only blame the ones who watched it on HBO. I saw all 10 episodes on a pirate site because I legally cannot watch HBO Max in Australia. Unfortunately, there is a bigger fan base outside the internet for a lot of adult comedies, including The Three Clones, Velma, and fortunately the same for other adult comedies like Hasbun Hotel, Smiling Friends, and whatnot. Season 3, I'm guessing, is going to be a short or special. It's not confirmed, but who knows? Warner may actually write off Velma. That's a joke. Don't actually. That harms anyone who works on the show because they can't actually release their work. But Velma may actually be retired. Obviously, they left a loose end in case they want to do more like with anything related to the underworld. But if it's anything, I don't think it'll get picked up. Unlike last time where HBO released each Velma episode each week, or two, at a t time, I don't give a fuck. This time they dumped every episode onto the platform, meaning they have no faith it'll last very long. And if you know the internet, unless you have a character, meme, a scene, a song or two, a hook to keep it alive, it will die off very soon. Hasbun Hotel was talked about for two months after its release, and one of the most popular shows that audiences are asking for. Before Season 2 of Smiley Franks was even released, one episode came out and it was even more popular due to Gwimley. While Captain Laserhawk is barely ever mentioned because the only two hooks are Raymond and the Assassin's Creed Frog. Overall, Velma, if it's ending, is a very crap mess of a show. How studios allow this garbage to survive while not giving shows that are better suited to the screen time to thrive will astound me. No one likes the show, they like the animation, but nothing about it. Take the hint. And again with this new ending gimmick of mine, if I can recommend any shows, I recommend Green Lantern the Animated Series. It's a really well done show and focuses on more Lantern media than anything before and after. Seriously, most Green Lantern staff will have Sinestro as the Yellow Lantern villain, and the only other show to have anything but yellow or green was the Red Lanterns in Justice League Action. It also has an amazing voice cast like Josh Keaton, Kevin Michael Richardson, Jason Spizak, Gray DeLissel, I'm sorry if I've pronounced any of those names wrong, and many more voices including Tara Strong. <laughs> Anyways, Spirit out.